Jeff how are you sir? Doing great. Good to see you. Tell me Jeff what do you do for me? Well um, you know it's been a while since we chatted and I think still very much working in the open source space. Uh, we're, we're keeping really busy as part of the one engineering system trying to make it easy for Microsoft engineers to use open source and to contribute to it and and all those fun things uh, just helping people become aware of how to be better open source stewards. Uh, this is um, as of I know, I've been in this company about seven or eight years, and uh, there's been a major shift in Microsoft's attitude towards open source during that time. Talk about that. Well, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's hard to recognize even what it used to be like. You know, I think early on, I, I worked on a project. It was the Silverlight Toolkit, and it was open source. The code was available, and initially, we didn't even accept contributions. So it was kind of here. We'll show you the code. You can use it however you want. But if you actually want to go and contribute to it, we're saying, oh, no pull requests. And that was on CodePlex. It, it's kind of funny hearing these funny words, you know, Silverlight and CodePlex. Like, yeah, it's been a while, for sure. But, <laughs> CodePlex is you know, a thing I'm going to share. Yeah. Um, you know, when I worked in Azure, uh, I worked in the Azure SDK team. And we actually were one of the first teams to go out and actually start using GitHub. And so that was a big thing for us to go out and kind of get executive approval saying, we want to accept contributions back. And so that was just a lot of fun. And you know, then you look today, like it turns out GitHub's part of the Microsoft family. We keep them pretty independent, but um, we're really happy of just how much it's been embraced. And you know, we, we have over 30,000 Microsoft employees on GitHub and just doing all sorts of great things. So it's exciting being a part of that for sure. So, um, so this whole shift is uh, now Microsoft is more open or more embracing of open source. Um, what, what, why are we doing that? What's the advantage of being more about open source than we were 10 years ago? Well, you know, I think clearly the cloud's a big part of that. And so, you know, there's definitely a point in time where interoperability was not the, exactly the same today. But, um, you know, today, if I want to go spin up a container, I can go use Linux, I can use Windows, I can use whatever I need to do to get my job done. And when I'm writing code, you know, sure, I, I might want to use Redis. And Redis is great at caching. And I can run Redis locally. I can run it in, you know, in AWS. I can run it in Azure. Uh, the reality is, like, it just helps me move my code around quite a bit. And so I think cloud's been a big part of that transformation for why open source is important, but it's also the, the reality that everyone wants to be part of this community now. And so as an engineer, I don't want to go learn about some Microsoft specific technology here at the company. I'd rather go use you know, what everyone else is using. I want to use React. I want to use Kubernetes. Um, and, and so I should be able to do that and feel you know, okay about contributing back. If I find an issue or I want to contribute a feature, um, that's really just something that's really flexible and, and an option today. And so you talked about the two sides of open source. One is the fact that Microsoft is open sourcing a lot of their software, and also that Microsoft Azure is supporting open source software that was created externally and managed That's externally. Right. Yeah. yeah. And now what's the role of your team in all this? Yep. So we're technically called the Open Source Programs Office, and that can be a lot of different things at different companies. Uh, it's short for the short version is called OSPO. And if you look at companies, whether it's Facebook or Amazon or Google, you know, all these companies do have an OSPO. And so I think it means something different for each company. But at Microsoft, it's really about how do we take what essentially is the, the best practices and the guidance for, you know, how do our lawyers feel about open source? And how do I help explain to an engineer what it takes to release code or to go contribute and kind of come up with a shared kind of set of you know, guidance or playbooks to go make it possible? And we've also had to build plenty of tools, you know. A lot of the things I work on are just GitHub at scale. How do I make it easy for a lot of people to use GitHub? But there's more than that. It's are the right licensing agreements in place? Do people know where to go to learn about how to use open source? If you use open source as a company, how do you keep a record of what you're using? And so we've done a lot of work in, in all those places. And I'm happy to talk more about them, but uh, it keeps us very busy, I'll say. Oh, yeah. Tell me about the, um, this idea. You've got tooling to keep track of open source software used internally within a company. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, every single build in the company automatically registers all the inventory of the open source components that it can detect. So if I have you know, a node project and it has 800 NPM dependencies, uh, at build time, it actually will take all of that in and actually record it. And so we can go back in the future and say, 
oh, on this date, Jeff used React version 17. And you know, if there's either you know, a vulnerability we become aware of, or maybe it's just something that you know, we should go take a second look at later, we can go back and figure out what specific builds use that specific piece of open source. So it's kind of a nice piece of tooling that we built to help us do that. And it also helps us make sure that you know, our licensing is in compliance. So if we use an open source package, we want to make sure that the license you know, is compatible with kind of how we think about open source. And if we have certain obligations like posting our source code, we make sure that that also happens by raising alerts. Yeah. Yeah, and you brought up the lawyers involved. They're, they're advising you on this. Can, can you discuss some of the legal issues with using open source? Well, I think each company of its own perspectives there. So I, I can't really share Microsoft specific you know, guidance too much, but I will say that you know, like when we go to release code, we tend to release our code today using the MIT license. It's just really, it's very much open. It says to anybody, come use it however you want. And, and so we feel it's very permissive and, and we like that piece. Um, there are certain open source packages and projects out there that if we use them, they'll have certain legal obligations such as sharing source code. And so we're actually totally fine to use almost any license, but we need to make sure that we're doing the right thing um, right. when we use something as requirements. So if you look at my, the Microsoft Edge browser, we have to publish a ton of source code uh, as a result of that. Uh, you know, so people go and actually build the browser themselves, and you can find that up on the web. Uh, the same thing goes for things like you know components and teams and other you know, other products of the company. So we just want to make sure we're doing everything we have to do. You know that that is very much um, part of the licensing story there. And what I think is very uh, interesting about our lawyers is that it's actually in many cases the same lawyers we were talking to five years ago, who maybe had a different stance on open source. They've really opened up and found ways for us to reduce kind of burden and work together to kind of come up with a much easier way to think about licensing and open source. So it's, it's kind of cool that the same people have evolved their, their approach for sure. Yeah, I can't imagine Steve Ballmer taking the same open, uh, approach to open source as Satya and Microsoft is today. He had a, he had a very different attitude. Yeah, well, I've been really thankful for you know, our open environment now for sure. Um, are you working with other teams that are open sourcing their software and their projects? and advising them? Um, sometimes. So we actually have a group inside the company. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. It's the Open Source Champs. And it's a single place that uh, anyone can kind of go and get advice from open source experts inside the company. And so one of the things we try to do is realize that there's no way that our small team is going to scale to all of Microsoft. And so we want to be able to identify you know, these champs that sit in organizations across the company. So if someone in the Windows team has a question about open source, there's probably someone close to them that's done it before. And so we want to kind of help make that introduction. Um, but if we look at other cases, there are absolutely, you know, I've, I've a meeting on my calendar coming up later today, actually, that is with the team that wants to talk about how they're using open source and how they want to go kind of evolve their approach. And so we'll meet with them as well. Um, sometimes we just connect people to other experts. You know, we're like highly paid network routers, I guess. We'll help tell, you know, connect you to the right people in the company, but we're, we're always there to help. And it's really interesting, the stories, because I think, not everyone has the same level of uh, expertise or experience with open source. And so sometimes it just takes, you know, reminding someone, hey, it's okay, it's been done before, um, go have fun, you know. And sometimes you just need to kind of give someone that encouragement. You know, it's okay to start a project in the open and start committing code, that's totally fine. And some teams think, well, gosh, I have to get it really ready before I kind of put it out to the world. And that's not always true. Yeah, I've noticed that uh, people are starting projects with just, with just a failing test. <laughs> A lot of my tests. Uh, yeah, but usually there's uh, usually that's a third or fourth thing that happens to me. I don't get uh, some code in before I even write the family test. But I've seen some uh, open source projects that are. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's not so much about the failing test; it's about the transparency. Is that from the very beginning, that initial uh, failing test that you write before you even write any code, that that's being published. In, uh, it's just, that's a big change again from the Microsoft of old. Yeah, definitely. Um, what else? What else are your team doing? Well, okay, so I'll, I'll tell you one of our bedlam stories. Um, oh, please. I don't know if you. I, I think I most bedlam. people know yeah, yeah. the bedlam history, but you know, it started back in the day from email exchange issues and okay. everyone in the company getting messages. But we actually recently had a bedlam incident on the GitHub side, and so um, inside the Microsoft organization on GitHub, there's a ton of people. Um, it's quite a large org. Tons of people are sitting there you know, working on their open source. And we actually have a team that's called Everyone. And the idea is that if I'm working on a repo, like ahead of a conference like Build, 
and I want to share it with anyone in the company to be able to send them a link, I would add the everyone company, the everyone team to have read access. And so in theory, that's great. That's awesome. Um, well, it turns out, you know, you can also request um, a pull request review or like a code review from a team. And so someone added everyone to their pull request. And so it sent, you know, tens of thousands of people an invitation to review their code. That's maybe a few too many people for a code review. And so, yeah. you know, it goes into this insanity. Then people are like, how do you know, remove me? Or they start commenting on it. And, you know, how oh, did I get invited to this? And <laughs> by the time you remove it, the damage is done. <laughs> it reminds me of those, those company-wide emails. People reply all to say, stop sending company-wide emails. It's just... Exactly. <laughs> That's a problem. Uh, very cool. Um, uh, is there anything we haven't talked about that we shouldn't? Well, I mean, here's a question for you. Um, yeah. Do you, do you work in the space? I've, I'm asking questions here. <laughs> you know, that's all right. Uh, yeah, well, I do. I have a GitHub account, and I post. Uh, I use it mostly to um, share demo code. So if I okay. write a blog post, the presentation, I like to have a sample application that I point to. Well, and that's great because you know I think back in the day, a lot of people just post like a zip file with their blog. But this way, if it's a repo, it lives on. You can open issues. You can update the code. I do. In fact, one of the things I've been doing recently is if I, it's not uncommon for me to write a series of blog posts. You know, here's step one, getting started. Here's something a little bit more advanced. And they build on each other. And if I put versions in my GitHub repository, I can actually point to a specific version. And then I don't have to three different projects in my repository to show the different stages. And I found that really, really helpful. I just nice. recently figured this out. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I knew I could do that, but I finally put these pieces together. But I think one of the things that we're trying to encourage people to do more now is actually contributing back. And I, if I look at some of the more recent hires we've had on our teams, I, I think it's kind of first nature. People are like, well, if I'm using open source, of course I contribute it back. And so if I, if I see a small bug or I want to improve the docs, you know, I'll just submit a pull request and fix it. Um, I think there's definitely people that years ago were maybe afraid of that. They weren't sure, like, do I have to get approval? What's it take to go contribute code back? And mm -hmm. so we're in, in this interesting place where we're actually trying to remind people, like, it's okay to contribute back. And so it's actually a great way to, like, get back to the world. Like, sometimes we might go and we might financially sponsor a team out there, you know, building an open source thing or, you know, giving, you know, essentially code contributions is a great way to help the community too. And so I think we're just trying to really remind people, like, totally fine, please do contribute. Contribute all you can because it helps the whole world do better at open source than just if we keep the code inside. Where are some places that they can contribute back to Microsoft? Well, I mean, really, it's almost anywhere. I mean, we, we do have a certain set of guidance for when and where, but you know, if I wanted to go contribute to like a Linux Foundation project or a Google project, I could really easily just kind of go and do that right on GitHub. Hmm. Also, even outside of Microsoft. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there, there is, uh, uh, with, certainly with GitHub, and with tools like Azure DevOps, there is an approval process. You can submit a pull request and someone will vet it and decide whether or not it, it makes sense to merge it with the main branch. And yep. so yep. there's risk mitigation there as well. Yep. Really nothing. All right, Jeff, well, thank you so much for your time. It's been really interesting. Always good to chat with you. And you stay safe. One of the great things about open source is that we're all friends together in technology.